Well, good morning, everyone. Hey, if you're a guest with us today and I haven't had a chance to meet you, my name is Jeff, one of the pastors here. And all of you in this room should know the answer to this one. This Wednesday is a pretty special day. Uh, this Wednesday is a celebration. What is Wednesday? That's right. Wednesday is the anniversary of Calvary Baptist Church. <laughs> no, seriously. Um, of course, Wednesday is Independence Day. Wednesday is the birthday of America. Wednesday is the day we celebrate as a country being 242 years old. But did you know on July 4th, 1908, Calvary Baptist Church started to bring the gospel to the Chattahoochee Valley? Which means on Wednesday... Your church, those of you who call this church home, is 110 years old. So do this. Go buy a cupcake and put 110 candles on there and go celebrate your birthday on Wednesday, July 4th. In honor of Independence Day, I want to set us up today by understanding this controversy. How many of you read in the newspapers just a week or so ago, two weeks ago, about Vice President Mike Pence going to the Southern Baptist Annual Convention in Dallas, Texas? Anybody see that in the news? There was tons of controversy about this. There was controversy before Mr. Pence spoke, and then after he was done, there was even more controversy and more division in the room. So I was there a couple of weeks ago, and I'll give you a summary of what I think happened um, when Vice President Pence came and spoke to almost 10,000 Southern Baptist pastors in Dallas, Texas. Here's basically how his speech went, and it was more than an hour long, but he spent about 20% of his time talking about his faith, and you couldn't avoid it. There is no doubt that man is a born-again follower of Jesus Christ. About 30% of the time he spent talking about our country, where our country is and where he believes our country is headed. And most of the people in the room, I think, would agree with what Vice President Pence said. But the other 50% of the time, and this is where it got really controversial really fast, the other 50% of the time he spent speaking about the President of the United States. And when it was over with, more people were divided, more people were uh, stirred to controversy than before the speech started. I don't care what side of the political party you're on, doesn't matter to me. I want you to hear something very carefully from me today, church. All of us in this room who know Jesus Christ personally, we don't look for somebody in the White House to fix the problems in America. We believe that the problems in our country are problems that start at the soul. They start in the heart of a man or a woman, and no president, no Congress, no courts can fix those kind of problems. Here's what I'm trying to say to you today, church. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, our hope is in the gospel, not in the government. And if you believe that, let me hear you say it. Amen. Our hope, as followers of Jesus Christ, is in the gospel of Jesus Christ, not in the government. We are commanded by scripture to honor our government and to pray for our leaders. And you should do that daily, not just on Independence Day. But that's not where our hope lies. Our hope lies in someone much bigger, in something much more powerful than the government of the United States. So today, we're going to describe the word gospel for you for the first time. If you look in those sermon notes, either in the mobile app or on that paper worship guide, you're going to see that today's sermon is about one word, the word gospel. And we're going to describe what does this word mean? What doesn't this word mean? And the centerpiece of the gospel, I'll tell you where we're going with this whole sermon. The essential person in the gospel story is the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what I want you to hear from me today. If you forget everything else, don't forget this. The gospel is a story, it's a true story, and the superhero of the story is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the greatest story ever told, and the center of the story is Jesus Christ himself. Now, in order for us to explain the gospel, we have guests with us today. This morning in our early service and today in this service alone, I've met people from Florida, from Pennsylvania, from Texas, 
and two from the Democratic Republic of China. And what I want you to understand today, without anybody missing it, is exactly what do we mean when we use this word gospel. So with the help of all the pastors this week, we prepared a statement. It's in your worship guide. Would you take out a pen or a pencil and fill in some blanks? Because when we say the word gospel, we want you to hear this statement in the back of your mind. Here it is. The gospel is the good news. First of all, pause for just a second. The gospel is actually a Greek word when it's brought into the English language, the definition of the Greek word is that, that phrase, good news. The gospel is the good news that Jesus saves sinners. The overall plot of the Bible is the gospel. The gospel has Jesus as the hero of the story and his church as the bride in need of rescue. The gospel is a story that consists of four chapters. Now, the Bible has more than four chapters, but if you want to summarize the whole Bible, if you want to summarize the whole Bible story, here it is in four chapters. And when you are sharing your gospel story with somebody else, these are the four chapters. Chapter one, creation. Chapter two, the fall. Chapter three, redemption. Chapter four, recreation. Let me explain those in very short sentences. Chapter one, creation. What God made was pure. What God made was perfect. God put his fingerprint on what he made when he made paradise. And it's perfect and it's pure. Everything that comes from God is pure and perfect. Chapter two, we human beings destroyed what God made. It's called the fall. It's original sin. It's our first parents, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden when they broke the only commandment that God gave them. And when they did that, they were infected with the disease of sin and they passed that disease on to every single person who's ever lived, who's come from a man and a woman. The disease of sin, you and I were infected with it. But listen carefully. When I say fall, I'm not just talking about Adam and Eve. I'm talking about me and you. Because you and I, since we were infected with the disease of sin, we fail, we make mistakes, we fall. And because of our sin, we are no longer acceptable in God's sight. That's why chapter three has to happen. God steps in and rescues us, redeems us, purchases us back from our sin. And he does it at a very severe price, at the most severe price. He sends his son Jesus to earth to die the penalty for death our, uh, in our place, to be buried in the ground, and then three days later to rise again. That's what the redemption story is all about. But that's not the end of the gospel story. The gospel ends with a chapter that we haven't yet had a chance to experience. One day... God's going to hit the reset button. And one day God's going to fix everything that people broke. He's going to restore perfection and purity. One day God will recreate everything. And those of us who know him personally will enjoy paradise in his presence forever. This is the gospel story. And when you share the gospel story, it demands a response. Here's the only proper response to the gospel story. The gospel requires the response from all who hear it. And the proper response of the gospel is repentance. That word means a change of heart and a change of lifestyle. Repentance and faith. It's not just saying that you believe it. It's showing that you believe the gospel story. So what we're going to do for the next few moments very quickly is we're going to look at this gospel and we're going to learn first how to understand it, secondly, how to share it, third, how to live it. If I, you can just fill in the outline and be done for the day right now. Here's the first thing that I want you to understand. Understand the gospel. This is the story of all stories, the greatest story ever told, and the centerpiece of the story is the Lord Jesus Christ. But if we're not careful, our focus can start to slip off of Jesus 
and start to become focused on someone or something else. And when that happens, according to the Bible, you're no longer believing the true gospel. In fact, what the Bible says for us today is you're not believing the gospel at all. Here's how the great writer of the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, puts this to a church that he went to. He preached a, the gospel story. Many lives were changed, and then he left. And after he left, some people came in, and they started distorting the gospel message. And in Galatians chapter 1, Paul writes a letter back to that church to deal with this issue. Here's what he says. I'm amazed that you are so quickly turning away from him who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to, a, look at the phrase, a different gospel. Now that can also be translated a false gospel or what he says next, no gospel at all. Verse seven, not that there is another gospel, like there's only one gospel and if you're believing or hearing something else, you're not hearing the gospel. But there are some who are troubling you and they want to distort the gospel of Christ. And let me tell you how serious this is for Paul. This is written for us today to be on our guard because listen to what he says next. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, a curse be on him, exclamation mark. That phrase, a curse be on him, literally means let him go to hell. If somebody is teaching you a false gospel, a different gospel, distorting the gospel, let them go straight to hell. And he'll say it a second time just so that you couldn't miss it. Verse nine, as we have said before, and I now say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, let that person go straight to hell. A curse be on them. The gospel that Paul is teaching, the gospel that Paul is preaching, is the gospel with Jesus Christ at the very center of it. Now you need to know, in Paul's day, people believed in God. Well, actually, I should say they believed in gods, plural. Twelve of them, in fact. This Greek church that Paul is preaching to, they had the idea that on Mount Olympus, you had these 12 demigods like Zeus and Hera and Poseidon and Athena. And that the gods controlled what was happening, but uh, there were multiple gods. And Paul had to go there and to address the the uh, idea that there is one God, only one God, and he has revealed himself to us in his son, Jesus Christ. And anything or anybody else that starts to take the place of God is now starting to teach or to preach a false gospel. And he's not just talking about somebody on stage with a pulpit. He's talking about anybody that you work with or anybody that shares a different message. Did you know then in our society, unfortunately, even in the Chattahoochee Valley, there are people that are subtly being tricked into believing a false gospel. It's when they add something to the story of Jesus or when they take something away from the story of Jesus. It's when it becomes Jesus and blank. doesn't matter what you add into that story. That gets somebody into heaven. When somebody starts to teach that, they're teaching the false gospel, a different gospel. And here's how it usually plays out in our society. People teach Jesus plus being a good person. Jesus plus going to church. Jesus plus giving your money. And if you'll do Jesus plus something else, then you'll be acceptable to God. And that idea is no different than what Paul is teaching in Galatians chapter 1. That's a false gospel gospel. In fact, it's no gospel at all. It's worse than silence because at least with silence, you're not distorting the story. With this gospel, you're distorting the truth. And the real issue is it minimizes who Jesus is. There's two extremes that even well-meaning people have to guard against when we talk about the gospel. It's the extreme version of Arminianism or the extreme version of Calvinism. 
I didn't say this very well at the first service, so I'm going to be very more, a little bit more careful in this service. Here's the danger, extreme version of Arminianism. Some people have taken what Jacob Arminius taught many years ago, and they've taken it to the extreme. And basically, they believe you do everything to be saved. God does nothing. In other words, God doesn't play a role in salvation. And here's how you know that that's what they believe. They leave out some very good biblical words like election, God's sovereign election or like foreordination. And they teach it's all on you and God doesn't have a role to play in this. But the opposite extreme, when taken to the extreme, is just as dangerous. It's this radical extreme version of Calvinism that teaches you have no responsibility in the gospel, that God sovereignly elects and you do nothing but sit on your rear end and everything else is done for you. And they fail to teach the proper human response to the gospel is repentance and faith. And I want you to warn you, church, we have to always be on guard against those extremes. I'm not saying that you shouldn't learn from Jacob Arminius or from John Calvin. I'm saying our view of the gospel is given by the scriptures. And any view of the gospel that doesn't line up with the Bible is just flat wrong. So perhaps the Florida pastor, Tullian Tavichian, described this math formula perfectly in the title of his book, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Jesus and you don't need anything or anyone else. Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection, and your response of repentance and faith equals everything. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. That's the gospel we want you to understand today. But we don't want you to just understand it. We want you to share it with people that God is already placing in your life. If you were with us last Sunday, we used this analogy in church of there is like a swimming pool, a shallow end and a deep end. And God's given all of us in this room, 20, 30 casual acquaintances. That's shallow end of the pool uh, relationships. But would you take two or three of those casual acquaintances into the deep end of the pool and turn them into gospel friendships where you're having gospel conversations with them? And if you're sitting there thinking to yourself, where exactly is the line, Jeff? Like, when does this shallow end end and the deep end begin? Well, there's one verse in the Bible that describes this for us perfectly. No, not John 3, 16, though that's a great verse. It's found in Acts chapter 16. And here it is. Backstory. Paul and Silas have been preaching fearlessly the gospel and the religious leaders hate them for it, and the Roman government is starting to feel threatened by it. So they throw him into prison. And while they're in prison, God does a miracle, and the earth shakes, and this is a miracle because the building doesn't collapse, but the chains fall off and the doors fly open. And the jailer, who's never seen anything like this, knows this cannot be explained any other way. How come the building didn't collapse? Just chains fell off, just doors flew open, so he runs in, and now he is burning with a question that every human being needs to wrestle with at some point in their lifetime. Acts chapter 16, starting in verse 29. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas after seeing the chains fall off and the doors fly open. And he, escor he escorted them out and he asked this question, the most important question any human being will ever ask in light of eternity. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And in one succinct answer, Paul and Silas share the gospel. Here it is. They said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him along with everyone in his house. He took them that same hour of the night and washed their wounds. Right away, he and all of his family were baptized. He brought them into his house. They went from being prisoners to being honored guests. He set a meal before them and rejoiced because he had, they had, he had come to believe in God with his entire household. 
Where exactly is the line between shallow end of the pool talking about the gospel and deep into the pool sharing the gospel conversations? If you've ever been to one of my marriage conferences, you've seen this video. Don't ruin it for everybody in the room who hasn't seen it. There's a great video that I use in a marriage conference to describe just how different men are from women in the way that they communicate with each other. But this video today tells something much more profound than just how different men and women are. In fact, in light of the gospel, this video really shows us the difference between shallow end and deep end of the pool. Y'all check this out. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless and I don't know if it's gonna stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever gonna stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop thing... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing. You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail. See, you're out. not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just. Sometimes it's like there's this achy. I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. Yeah, I, that sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on. Ow. If you would just... Don't! All right, let's just be honest. How many of you have been sitting there listening to a friend in a coffee shop and they've been pouring out their heart and talking about all of the problems that are going on and this feels an awful lot like we're talking about snag sweaters and hairstyles when we both know it's the nail. I've got to talk to you about the nail. If we're going to have a gospel conversation, at some point we have to talk about the nail of sin and the only one that can get rid of it for you. Jesus Christ, the superhero of the gospel story. You see, what Paul is trying to teach us in this passage um, in Acts chapter 16, what Paul said to that jailer is described vividly for us in the book of James. When we use the word believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, the word believe, when it's brought over into English from the original language, it loses something in translation. See, you could think that all that means is you just understand that there really was a guy by the name of Jesus. He lived 2,000 years ago. He's no different than Abraham Lincoln or George Washington. That's not the kind of belief that the Bible is talking about. In fact, James chapter 2, verse 19 says it this way. If you think that you're okay because you believe in Jesus, uh, that's not good enough. In fact, the demons believe. And when they believe, they tremble. No, the kind of belief that the Bible is asking you to do is the difference between believe in Jesus and believe on Jesus. See, it's like this chair right here. You could say until you're blue in the face, I believe this chair is strong enough, built to sustain my body weight. You can say you believe like that all day long but you're really not believing on this chair until you take a seat in it and trust it to hold your weight. And when you've done that, now you've exercised biblical belief. See, the belief that the Bible asks you to do is not just say, yeah, there was a guy by the name of Jesus. He lived a long time ago. It's the kind of belief that you take a step into the darkness and you're willing to risk it all on this guy named Jesus and believing that he's going to meet you when you take that step of faith. You see, there's a subtle difference, but there is a significant difference between shallow into the pool ministry and deep into the pool gospel conversations. 
I'm going to be very clear. I want to clear up all that I can for you today about my thoughts on the ministries of Calvary Baptist Church. Look up here. We earn the right to have deep gospel conversations by listening and loving people. We show them that we care by listening to them. We show them that we love them by the way that we do what we do. And that earns us the right to have gospel conversations. Here's what I'm saying. We have a counseling center. It literally changes marriages, changes families. It changes people's lives that are on the edge and thinking about suicide. But if that's all that it does and doesn't do anything with the gospel, it's shallow into the pool ministry. You heard just a minute ago, we have 200 senior adults that live on this campus and we take care of them 24 hours a day, seven days a week, most of them. But if that's all we do, it's shallow into the pool ministry. Our school, our Christian school has students from two states, seven counties, 700 students that are exposed to the arts, to athletics, to some of the best academics in the Chattahoochee Valley. But if that's all we do, it's shallow into the pool. We do this ministry, counseling senior adults, school, to earn ourselves the right to be able to have a deep into the pool conversation with people about the gospel. And we owe it to the people that live here, the people that are counseled here, the people that are going to school here and their parents to take the opportunities to have those gospel conversations with them. That's the opportunity that you, are, you earn the right to share deep into the pool conversations with them. Look, y'all, God is commanding us. Don't just understand my gospel. Don't just share my gospel, though I certainly want you to earn the right by listening and loving people to share my gospel. If you call yourself my follower, I want you to live out my gospel. And here's what living out the gospel looks like. When you sat down at a coffee shop and you started to have a conversation with somebody and you started talking to them about the nail of sin and they prayed in that coffee shop with you and they said this prayer and they said they were committing to Jesus Christ, if they got up the next day and went right back to the same affair that they're having in their marriage, went right back to stealing from work, went right back to cheating on final exams at college, and there was no change in their life? Did they really understand the gospel? Or the better question is this, are they really living the gospel? You see, Philippians tells us what it looks like to live the gospel. Here it is, Philippians chapter 1 starting in verse 27, just one thing, as citizens of heaven, I started this whole story with uh, Vice President Mike Pence to remind us, though we live in the greatest country that's ever existed on planet earth, my citizenship is not here. It's in heaven and I am just here temporarily. And because I'm a citizen of heaven, look at what it says on the screens, live your life worthy the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or am absent, standing firm in one spirit, in one accord, contending together for the gospel or for the faith of the gospel, not being frightened in any way by your opponents, this is a sign of destruction for them, but of your salvation. And this is from God. And by the way, the writer of this passage, the Apostle Paul, he knows what it means to suffer. He has heard the stories of Jesus' suffering, and he's promising us that chances are, if you're going to be serious about living the gospel, you're going to suffer too. Listen to this. For it has been granted to you on Christ's behalf, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Since you are engaged in the same struggle, that you saw I had, and now here I have. Paul is saying, look, it's not easy to live out the gospel. It's just flat hard. Jesus made this promise. They persecuted me. They hated me. They're going to hate you too. I promise you it's going to be a struggle, but you don't struggle on your own. He uses language like together and with one another in this passage to remind you, you have the Holy Spirit 
going with you when you suffer. And you have God's people right beside you as you suffer and live out the gospel. Paul is saying, it's not good enough just to say it. You really need to show it. And if you're going to show it, don't be surprised if this gets hard really fast. But when it does, you're not on your own. I'm going to wrap up with this. I really started to get serious about sharing my faith many years ago because of a sermon that I heard here in Columbus, Georgia, many years ago. It was actually one verse of the Bible. And I read this verse and I went home and I started thinking about it. And then all of a sudden, God just impressed on me the overwhelming desire to see my friends and my coworkers experience the same gospel story that I've experienced. Here's the verse that the preacher was talking about many years ago. Acts 1.16. And Acts says this, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation. That word power is literally the word dynamite. It is the dynamite of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, and in Paul's day, everybody else, to the Greeks. This is for everyone. I started thinking about this thing. I started going home, and I had this image. The Holy Spirit put this image in my mind of what the power of the gospel is like. It's like God lighting a stick of dynamite, placing it in your hands, and saying, go use this to make an impact on somebody else. I started having this vision of God creating a masterpiece, a sculpture. And in order to do this masterpiece, he has to first use the dynamite of the gospel to explode away all of the junk and get to this piece of stone. And then he takes this piece of stone out. He explodes away the sin and the filth of my life with the gospel. And then he takes this piece of stone out and he starts to chip and he starts to hone off all of the stuff that shouldn't be there. And now it's like a worker um, moving on a granite piece of rock, making a masterpiece. And when he's done, that masterpiece doesn't look like me. It doesn't look like you. Over the course of a lifetime, that masterpiece looks like Jesus. Here's what I'm trying to say to you. The gospel is every bit as important for me and you today who believe as the person who's never heard it and needs to hear it for the first time. Listen to this language from North Carolina pastor J.D. Greer. Here's what he says in his book entitled, one word, gospel. He says, the gospel is not merely the diving board of which you jump into the pool of Christianity. The gospel is the pool itself. So keep going deeper into it. You'll never find the bottom. You and I need the gospel as much today as the person who's never heard it. The gospel explodes away sin and God uses it to pull me out of the mire of sin. But then he uses the gospel to start to chip away and start to fashion me into a masterpiece. That masterpiece is his son, Jesus Christ. And we're asking you, church, to keep the superhero the center of the story. Keep Jesus the center of the gospel story and share it widely with people that God is already placing into your life. We're gonna challenge you. Don't just hear, as Pastor Michael said a minute ago, be doers of the Bible. And here's some possible ways that you can respond. Maybe you came in the door today and you didn't really understand the gospel. Number two on the screens. And maybe you now understand it for the first time. I mean, you, you did something a long time ago and you meant it, but you just didn't really understand all that it entailed. And now you do. Would you do something with it? Would you do what number three on the screen says? Would you live out this week at work or this week at home in front of your children, in front of your wife or your husband? Would you live out that gospel power? But perhaps somebody came in this door, not really knowing Jesus as Savior. And you need this gospel, the power of this gospel to change you for the first time. If that's the case, then I want to say a prayer for you. And I'm going to invite you to ask God to change you from the inside out, not just to make somebody a better person in this room, 
but to take somebody who was fallen in sin, dead in sin, and recreate them into a new human being made alive in Jesus Christ. Would you bow your heads and let me pray for you right now? Father, you alone can look in the human heart. You know what's happening right now in people's hearts. You know if somebody in this room does not know your son, Jesus Christ, personally as Savior. And if that's the case, would you do a miracle in their heart? Would you transform somebody from dead in sin to alive in Christ through believing on Jesus? Maybe, Holy Spirit, you would make it possible for somebody right now, just quietly in their own soul, to surrender to Jesus in the form of a prayer or something like this. God, I am a sinner. I can't be good enough, can't be religious enough, can't give enough money to earn forgiveness for my sins. I see that today. The center of the gospel story is that you love me enough that you didn't leave me in my sin. You sent your son Jesus to save me from my sin. And so right here, right now, God, this is just between the two of us. I'm turning from my sin. And I'm trusting you for the first time. And Father, if that prayer is real, if it's sincere, would you do a miracle of recreation in their heart right now? Would you explode away the sin? And would you start to fashion them into your son, Jesus? And would you give us the privilege of knowing about the commitment that these people are making? Maybe there are others in this room, God, who are saying, hey, I really didn't understand this gospel, but I do today. And if that's the case, Father, help us as a church to pray for them, to encourage them. I am so proud, God, of the people in this church who are right now taking two or three of their casual acquaintances and already turning them into gospel friendships. Some folks in our church let us know who those people are by name last week. We're praying for those people by name, but God, I pray that many more will be transformed by the gospel of your son, Jesus. So God, would you do what only you can do? And we'll give you the credit for it. Pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.